Okay, so now we're going to talk about interest groups very fast. Like I said, uh, I don't want to use up a lot of space here on uh, filming. So we're going to do this very quickly. And let me just hit the share screen. Let's see here, screen one. I think that's what I want. Okay, so we're going to talk about interest groups. And we're going to define what is an interest group. If I can get out here. It's a group of people who seek to influence the personnel and policies of government. If you notice, that it's, it's very close to what a political party is. A political party tries to control the personnel and policies of government. Interest groups aren't trying to control it. They're trying to influence in their favor on a particular policy. Now, there are different types of interest groups. Your book narrows them down to economic, non-economic, and mixed. Um, if you're probably a Marxist historian, then you probably believe that almost everything is economic. Everything is driven by economics. But... We're going to break them down even further into occupational groups, for example. And these are people with similar occupations. Um, so, whoops, here we go. Uh, 1A, business groups. These are like the National Chamber of Commerce, National Association of Manufacturers, uh, the, the Texas Association of Manufacturers, the Texas Chamber of Commerce, there's a Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce, uh, Dallas Chamber of Commerce, Burlington Chamber of Commerce, you name it. Uh, then there are labor groups. Um, these are groups that organize in behalf of labor, like the AFL, the CIO, the Teamsters. They're, they want to be able to be laws that will make it easier for them to organize and better workman's comp. Uh, that's certainly an economic group. Um, oops, skip one there. Uh, farmers, uh, they want to promote Texas farm products and limit government regulations. Of course, again, that could be considered economic. Uh, there's the Texas Farm Bureau, the National Farmers Union. Uh, and then there are professional groups uh, like the um, American Bar Association, that's the ABA, uh, the American Medical Association, uh, the Texas Bar Association, those are the Texas lawyers, and even uh, there's a TCCTA, the Texas Community College Teachers Association. Then we have ethnic and religious groups. Uh, for example, if we look at uh, African Americans, they're represented by the NAACP and the Urban League. Uh, Hispanics are uh, represented by LULAC and MALDEF, uh, LULAC League of United Latin American Citizens, MALDEF Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Uh, there are Jewish Americans, the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee. And I, I choose Jewish Americans because that's sort of a, a transition uh, because if you say Jewish, is that a religion? Is that an ethnicity? Is it a nationality? So it's a nice uh, segue into religion. And make sure that we know that there are groups that represent Polish Americans, Italian Americans, Irish Americans, Korean Americans, uh, Chinese Americans, uh, Arab Americans, uh, you name it, Indian Americans. There are groups that represent almost every ethnicity that you can think of. Same way with religion. Uh, for example, Protestants, National Council of Churches, National Association of Evangelicals. Um, Protestants are all those people who are um, non-Catholic of the Christian faith. Uh, if you take the first seven letters and you get the word protest, that shows you some, some origin here. Uh, you can also look at Catholics. Uh, the Catholics has the U.S. Catholic Conference. Then we'll divide that up into the uh, patriotic and civic groups, uh, League of Women Voters. That's probably non-economic. Uh, their job is to inform people about elections and candidates. Got to make sure I don't uh, try to keep track where I'm going here. Here's some more patriotic uh, uh, civic groups, the American Legion and the Veterans of Foreign War. They look after the interests of veterans. Very important to Texas because of the Veterans Land Program. Um, there's the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. They look out uh, for what they perceive as your First Amendment rights, I say perceive, because we can all debate those things. Uh, sometimes unpopular because they've defended Nazis and they've defended the Klan. Uh, then there are groups like uh, watchdog groups like the American Conservative Union and Americans for Democratic Actions. Those are conservative and liberal groups that look at the voting re records of uh, members of Congress. They have as watchdogs to let you know what what is uh, what what is your member of Congress actually voting for. I mean, they may say they're liberal, they may say they're conservative or whatever, but what's their voting record? Because that's really how you can tell. And then there are public interest groups like Public Citizen, funded by Ralph Nader. Uh, they want to make government and business more responsive to you, more open, more transparent. Um, 
Common Cause, founded by a Republican by the name of John Gardner. They support reforms in government that most Americans favor. So if most Americans favor, for example, a balanced budget amendment, um, they would uh, favor, they would work for that. Uh, same way in Texas. This was actually founded in Texas after the famous Sharpstown stock fraud scandal. You figure we've, we've got to come up with a better name than that for a, a scandal. Uh, we can also look at Greenpeace and the Sierra Club. These are environmental groups. They look out for what they perceive the interest of the environment. And then last but not least, I put in single issue groups that primarily focus on one issue. For example, um, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, they since the 1980s worked to reduce the uh, number of drunk driving deaths and have been fairly successful at doing so. Uh, but that's also because of uh, better cars, better uh, cars are more safer than they used to be. Uh, but there are also stricter penalties for drunk driving and more education about drunk driving. Uh, the, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, they fight for what they perceive are your Second Amendment rights. Uh, as an example, the AARP, the American Association, Association of Retired Persons, would be another. So we have a lot of interest groups in the United States. Um, I just give you a few. There are thousands of them. So why are there so many? Well, the strengths are the political environment. We have freedom in this country. You don't see interest groups in North Korea uh, or China, but here we have uh, we have free speech, we have freedom of assembly, we have the right to petition our government. So the political environment allows for interest groups to take, uh, take hold. The idea of checks and balances is that uh, this gives interest groups a chance to if they fail at one level of government, they can go to another. For example, if they can, if they want to try to stop a bill in the Texas Senate, uh, in the Texas House, they try to stop in the Texas House, but they can't get it stopped. So then they go to the Texas Senate, they try to stop it there. Then if, if it goes through the Texas Senate, then they try to get the governor to veto it. If the governor doesn't veto it, they can take it to court. There are several avenues of success that they could go. I call this the three L's, uh, it's leadership, loyalty, and money. I mean, not really three L's, but we, we can say loot. You gotta have strong leadership to be an effective interest group. You've gotta have loyal members who are in a, as an effective interest group and you gotta have money. And we tend to have weak political parties. Um, political parties can't really punish their own members, but interest groups can punish those people who don't support them by supporting their opponent or withholding money uh, for their campaigns. Weaknesses. Well, the weaknesses is that you could argue that there's a diversity of interest groups, that for every interest group, there is an opposing uh, interest group. Uh, there's just so many of them, and they can fight amongst themselves. Business fights labor, uh, doctors fight business, you name it. Uh, business fights environment, and business fights a lot of people. I don't mean it sound that way. Uh, parties have superior organization. They're organized in every, as we, as we saw in the lecture a couple of days ago maybe yesterday, that parties are organized at the precinct level, the county and the state level. So their superior organization can be mobilized to defeat interest groups at times. And then the three L's again, leadership, loyalty and money. If you don't have enough leaders, if you have weak leaders, that becomes a problem. Uh, if you don't have loyal members that all they do is just sign up to be a member, but they don't ever write letters or donate, it doesn't do you any good. And if you don't have any money, it doesn't do you any good. So let's talk about the methods interest groups use. One is electioneering. They try to get candidates elected who support their position. And they do this by having, by going to vote for that candidate, by volunteering in their campaign, by donating money. They often form political action committees to pool money to give to candidates. Electioneering. Uh, lobbying, lobbying is putting direct access on government officials. Now, the first goal of every lobbyist is to gain access. You've got to get your foot in the door or you can't, you can't influence that person. So gaining access. That's why many lobbyists are ex-legislators or ex-staff members because they know the people down in Austin. Uh, strangely enough, lobbyists write most bills and do most of the research for bills. If you think it's your Texas senator or your Texas representative, you're wrong. It's usually, it's usually an interest group person doing it. But their research must be accurate. If you come in there with a bunch of misinformation, then you're going to have no credibility with the members. So you must uh, have accurate information and you have to maintain ethical standards. If you're not being ethical, uh, you get caught bribing somebody or doing something terrible, it's in the news, 
then no other member of the legislature wants to be seen within 10 miles of you because it'll hurt their reelection chances. Uh, they also do advocacy where they promote a particular public policy position, you know, no income tax, lower property taxes, uh, you name it, whatever law you want to think about. Sometimes they'll do astroturf lobbying. Um, you can see the definition right here, fabrication of public support for issues supported by interesting groups, but give the impression of widespread support. They make it seem like their issue is a grassroots, that the common folk is really for this when probably the common folk don't know. Uh, but that's astroturf lobby because that's fake grass, fake grassroots. That's where it comes from. Uh, they also do court action. They sue. I mean, that's what all good Americans do, oddly enough. Uh, they usually act as an amicus curiae, which is Latin for friend of the court. This is a person who's not part of the lawsuit. An interest group rarely is, but they want to see a particular outcome. And so they submit a brief, which is a series of legal arguments with the intent of influencing the court's decision. And then, of course, they use propaganda. Uh, they advertise and they try to make their interests seem like the public's interests. Ah, it's pretty easy. So that was the fast version. Now, if that was fast, the good news is you can watch this over and over and over again. Oh, that would be terrible. But you can uh, if I went too fast. But I tried to keep this fairly short. So test starts tomorrow. So get ready. And um, I will start working on lectures for unit three. Uh, pr probably going to spend the next two hours up here at school working on the test of, for unit three. So good luck on the test. If you've got any questions, uh, please send me an email.